when a physician gives a glowing recommendation about something, there's immediately this air of suspicion that the, pay, the physician's being paid to do that. Um, I will say that Bradley waived my fee to come here today, but I could have made more money for my practice if I had stayed home. So I want everyone to understand that in my work for the heart.org and WebMD, um, I, am, I do not take any kickbacks from the pharmaceutical industry or device industry at all. So this is coming from my heart. And it is unbiased, and I do believe that they do harbor the secret of success for treating patients with cardiovascular illness. In South Central Kentucky, we have so many patients who are below the age of 40 that have had their first heart attack. We have a 27-year-old that died of inoperable coronary disease. I've treated three patients that are teenagers with their first myocardial infarction. I have scores of patients in their 40s that have had their first stent. Um, we have a large population of patients who are sedentary and who smoke, and we also have a lot of genetic pooling of risk in our region. So not only do we need to be focusing on how to acutely revascularize those patients, but we need to figure out what makes them tick, why are they at such high risk, and then try to approach it more than just from a me mechanical standpoint. We have to understand what drives their inflammation and their atherogenicity and their thrombosis. Unfortunately, I think that at this point in time, there are so many of us cardiologists that don't really understand the implication of acute revascularization and the limitations of revascularization. I try to explain to patients and even to other physicians that a stent with STs up is life-saving. A stent in patients who have stable angina is life-changing. But if you send that patient out the door without actually trying to figure out what drives the, the thrombosis and the inflammation, that patient has only been temporized. And until we understand the thromboinflammatory axis in these patients, we are going to see the same patients coming back, coming back, until one day they don't come back. I think the first thing from the lay public's perspective is they don't understand that the vascular tree has many branches. And when we find a problem in the neck, it signifies that we might have a problem in the heart arteries, that we might have a problem in the leg arteries, the splank neck beds, etc. I think that's a problem with the lay public. Uh, so often they don't understand that since they are sitting in wound care clinic, that 25% of them in that room with them that day are going to be dead in five years. They don't understand that the leg is sick, so maybe the heart or may I also have a risk of stroke. They don't put that together. But it's not just the lay public. It's also a lot of us as physicians. And we think we've done our job if we put the patient on aspirin and carry nitroglycerin and give them a single statin. And we think if our numbers look great on paper, we've done our job. But then we are surprised when they come back three years later with an acute myocardial infarction, or worse, we read about them in our local obituaries. And that's how this information should translate into the hearts and minds of physicians around the world. We have to understand the mechanism that drives death and stroke and heart attack. And I think that we're beginning to understand it. And of course, 10 years from now, we're going to know even more than we know now. We have all this information down the pike. But there is a great disconnect between the guidelines writers and the understanding of basic wall physiology when it comes to vessel pathology. And I think that this course really connects those dots very well. I think the way that this method differentiates is it pays homage to glucose intolerance, which is the real biggie when it comes to understanding what's going to bring your patient back or where, why that patient became your patient to begin with. About five years ago, 
I accidentally learned about the metabolic syndrome. I went to the European Society of Cardiology meeting. I just heard a gentleman speaking in the next room while I was waiting for the meeting that I was going to cover. I sat down, I took out my notepad, and it was Dr. Gabrielle Steg that was talking about the metabolic syndrome. And when I came back to America, I started glucose testing everyone that I could, you know, that had atherosclerosis, um, and I found so many glucose intolerance. Then I found, it's very frustrating for me because when I would tell the patients you have a two hour postprandial that is 250, I would tell them that this is a lethal finding unless you address it. They would actually go back to their primary care physician and be told that that was really not such a big deal and it was a borderline diabetic case and don't worry about it. I submit to you that the reason why uh, what Amy and Bradley do help so many people is that they understand that that's what drives inflammation. They understand that that's what's crippling our population. So when you look for glucose intolerance and then you begin to treat glucose intolerance, then you're going to start to see a lot of patients benefit with regard to mortality as well as restenosis and repeat ACS hospital admissions. The ideal would be if every CEO in America would actually say to their medical staff, I'm going to bring the bail donine course to this facility because we talk about the cost of health care all the time and we're really like a hamster on a little wheel. We keep putting in stents and doing bypass surgery and putting in more stents and doing more bypass surgery, but we haven't really told the population what makes the wheel spin. So when we get the hamster off the wheel and we make them exercise appropriately, eat the right diet, make sure that we understand what's driving disease, when we hand these tools to the family physician, the internist, the cardiologist, the lipidologist, when we hand these tools to them, we'll start to see our population be healthier and happier. And at this, in this, this economic environment, it'll be less expensive. I just went to Frankfort, Kentucky, and I asked them to help cover the uh, cost of smoking cessation. I had an example of one gentleman who's 47 years old, and it cost Kentucky taxpayers $500,000 to get this one individual to be 47 years of age. We have so many of these people in my hometown that are not only dying, which is a tragedy, but driving up the cost of health care. If we could bring the bail donine method to Glasgow, Kentucky on a global basis, we're already blessed to have Philip Bradley's brother there, but you don't understand how resistant people are to taking this knowledge and implementing it in the general population. When CEOs help to drive this change, it's going to help their hospital to save money. It's going to help their patients to save money. It's going to help make more grandparents. Right now in Glasgow, Kentucky, we don't have a lot of grandparents because they die or they are not able to enjoy their grandchildren because they are so ill. They're tethered to oxygen, they have heart failure, they have uh, refractory angina. And if we could just bless our population with this information, then we could really make the difference it's going to take to save us from ourselves. My experience with the guidelines writers in our country, and I know that they're making the best effort they think they can based on the information they have, but they are woefully behind the current information database that's out there. And a great example of that is I've been trying to promote primary PCI without surgery on site like our friends in Europe have been doing for years. And I met with great resistance in the state of Kentucky. We've been through three governors, several uh, cabinet meetings, Kentucky Hospital Association meetings, and we finally did it. You know, several of us cardiologists band together and we finally did it, but it took a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and stress to try to promote that to the population. And it's so life-saving. We are going to have to do the same thing with the bail donine method that we did with primary PCI without surgery on site. I can't tell you how important it is just to be persistent. Be persistent and utilize every aspect of the media to try to get the information out. In this situation, though, 
it's probably going to require the lay public demand it and that probably will work more quickly than physicians getting the information and then dumping it back to the patients. Because I think once you show a patient their two-hour postprandial blood sugar is 250 and explain to them what that means and how that will impact their longevity, I think those patients will then start to demand better therapies. There is no doubt about the fact that we save lives when patients are in the middle of a heart attack with a stent or acutely revascularizing someone that needs bypass surgery that can't be stented if they're in the middle of a heart attack. But that is such a small portion of what is happening to patients in the world of cardiology. How many patients, congestive heart failure is our most expensive DRG in America. If we can get at the thing that drives our most expensive DRG, which is largely glucose intolerance, then you have just helped President Obama to understand the secret to saving money in health care. You know, I w if I could get into the room with President Obama and say, I want to help you understand how to save money, I would tell him to glucose test America and make America smoke free and give tax incentive to try to help uh, promote programs for exercise in factories and wherever patients are employed in large volumes. The bail donine method actually speaks to all of those things. In my history of being a blogger and someone who works in the world of journalism, I've never seen a course that was so chock full of information that was practical. So it's practical for America and it's practical on an individual basis as well.